Raj Garcay for the post screening conversation. My name is Dilsey Barrera. I'm one of the programmers for the festival. Now help me welcome to the stage, or back to the stage, the director of La Llorona, Jairo Bustamante, and producer Gustavo Cateo. I also, I want to repeat what an honor it is to have you guys here. It's your first time at Sundance, and we've loved all your work, and we're really happy that you accepted our invitation to be part of Sundance. The honor is for me. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to kick off the conversation, and but if you're compelled to ask any questions, please raise your hand up high so we can see you. We have lights in our eyes. Um, I wanted to start off by maybe speaking about La Llorona as the story. It's so um, it's such a common and consistent story to Latin Americans. Why did you want to use this story to tell um, what's happening? in your country currently? So, uh, just before to answer the question, I want to say some little thing, because every time when I watch the end of the film, for the people who were, were watching the big screen, uh, the big screen, there is all this name, or more than 900 people who work with us, like uh, support actors, and they are all uh, kids of victim of the war or victim of the war themselves. So to us, it was a big honor to have all these people working uh, because they have the same need that we have. And uh, this is the need of talk about this, this horrible story that we lived and, and trying to find peace and find peace for their disparate people. So to come to, the, to La Llorona, La Llorona is a very, very important mm, legend in Mesoamerica. In Latin America, but in Mesoamerica, is one of the most famous. I think in Mexico, for example, she is one of the three icons, feminine icons, you know, it's like a, La Malinche, La Llorona and La Virgen de Guadalupe. So it's very, very important. And we really love her. But the legend is very misogynistic, very machist. And we were thinking about Latino Guatemala and Latin America like um, a motherland crying their kids disparate. And, and we said, we will use La Llorona, like in this metaphor, because she's tired to, to cry her kids too. But we will change the, the legend, because in the, in the original legend, La Llorona is crying because a man abandoned her. And I think La Llorona can cry for more relevant things than a man. <laughs> So it was the opportunity to change the story and make uh, to La Llorona um, a justice character. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody have a question? Uh, we'll start off. Um, the scene where they brought the general or into the uh, house and there was, you know, writing all that scene was crazy. How did you shoot that? Oh, it was very particular. You know, all the exterior scenes are very particular to shoot because we receive some kind of advices uh, from people um, who we don't know who are, saying, it's better if you stop shooting this film, it's better if you don't shoot this film. So. At the end, we had to shoot the film in the French embassy, uh, in the French residence, in the Mexican embassy, and in the um, Jesuit University. So it was very hard because we had a garden, and we had to make up the garden like a street. And, and we had 500 uh, <coughs> actors, uh, playing the the manifesto, and 
And I think it was hard for us in, in terms of a production, but it was harder for the lead actors because the, the support actors really hit them. <laughs> they were very, very into the role. <laughs> Uh, and they were um, carry all this suffering and all this, yeah, suffering. I don't want to use the, the word hate. Uh, suffering is okay. I don't know if you want to add something about this thing because it was a very hard thing in terms of production. No, I think it's, that's pretty much accurate. Like, uh, not only to shoot uh, or have to fake the exteriors and interiors because we were like threatened by the government, by the military, so it was we had to fake all of the exteriors. And also, yeah, like, like Hado said, these people were actually uh, like the, the daughters and sons of the people that got missing in the war. So it was for them, it was like a psychologist street, like they, they were screaming to the general the things. They couldn't say to the real one, so at the end it was very hard to like stop shooting because they were all crying and they were like, like really wanted to kill him. Like it's the people were like dancing over the when they were getting out of the ambulance, but uh, it was very, very, very interesting to to have like because I think those people needed that closing too, even though it was just fiction. So it was also like a therapeutical process for them. So you talked about that being a therapeutic process. So obviously Rios Mont never got this kind of justice. Do Guatemalan audiences, uh, it, is it relieving for them to, to have this fantasy where Rios Mont can um, suffer or are people defensive of his legacy or do people not even know Rios Mont anymore? Oh, there is a little bit of all that you said. And we didn't show this film in Guatemala, and we want to show it soon. And but it's a it's not an easy thing because um, we can't talk about genocide in Guatemala because people don't want to accept that, and and because there is a lot of victim of a war. There is not just the victim coming from the army, there is the victim coming from the guerrilla too. And it's, if you are talking in Guatemala about human rights, you are cataloged like a communist. And if you are a communist, you are a guerrilla. And if you are a guerrilla, you are against of the military. And the military are the state, so you are a traitor. And that is a big problem because they don't want to talk about that. So La Llorona is a, a nice pretext to talk about that problem because we, we really create a kind of a strategy saying maybe if we use this legend that people love and if we use all the code of horror films <coughs> that people love too, we can touch their soul, like La Llorona is touching the soul of the general and their family. One thing that actually impacted me when I saw this film in Toronto was you mentioned your films, you discussed these words, these three words in your, in your last three films. Um, do you want to talk about what three words and what each one was, um, what you did in each, each film with these words? I don't want to. Yeah. So, I, I'm sure that Guatemala is a country built on the base of discrimination, and that is the problem of, that is the last of the old problem that we have. And we are really proud using the three worst insults in our country, and but really, people use it like with all the liberty and freedom. And the first one is Indio. And when you know that uh, we, Indio is um, original people or indigenous people, and when you know that more than 75% of the population in Guatemala are <coughs> Mayan, uh, you are just saying that you are not proud about yourself. And 
so people have to hide their origins and and they are living on the really the, the first step of the of the of the pyramid. And the second insult is hueco, who means holes, literally, but it's the word that we use to insult gay men. And for sure, we are a homophobic society, but that is not a problem, because this insult is more close to a misogynistic insult, because if you are a man, uh, gay at the same time, in Guatemala, they think that you are trying to be feminine. And doing that, you are losing your power, your sacred father's power. So um, it's a very complicated insult because it's not saying no, only homophobia. And the third insult is communist. And communist is used to insult all the people who protect human rights individual rights, social rights, others. We have time for one more question. Yes. Thank you. 